The Utah Gymnastics team is off to a hot start. What's led to this early success? And we're previewing their big matchup with the top-ranked team in the NCAA, Oklahoma, on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Lockdown News your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube. My name is JT Wistersill, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. And on today's show, we're talking all things Red Rocks, the Utah gymnastics team, currently the fifth-ranked program overall, and going to have a great opportunity to climb up even higher with a big showdown with Oklahoma coming up this weekend. But they've already had two meets. They've been very successful at it. As I mentioned, I'm a former intern inside the athletic department, and that's why I'm excited to have on someone who's been not only a mentor to me, but you guys have heard him calling Utah gymnastics. He's done Utah basketball games, Utah football games over the year, and just someone who's been a mainstay along the Utah athletics program. And that is voice of the Red Rocks, Mike Lagaschultz. And Mike, when you're talking about this Utah gymnastics team, they have just been unbelievable for years now. And it really is a credit to the team that coach Tom Barden has built for this group. And as you look at this year's team, look, it feels like another team has a chance to compete for a national championship and they've got off to a very hot start. What are your thoughts on this team and through two events, which you've called so far? Like well, spot on. It is a team that should be in the running once we get the Fort Worth in April. But um, you know, it really you, you talk about the the program over the years. It's fun to look back. We celebrated 50 years of Town Nine this fall with a large Bay Hospital Center, and to, to look back and what Gray Marsden did to start the program was with the program for 40 years. Tom Farnham was his successor, handpicked. So Megan Marsden was co-head coach with Gray towards the end, and then started with Tom. But really, Gray's plan was, you know, Megan will retire at some point too. We need someone younger to really take this thing, take the baton from us. And he handpicked Tom from Southeast Missouri State. Uh, he was also an assistant coach at Arkansas. But Gray just felt like Tom was the right guy to take the program and, and really keep it going. And that's what Tom has done now. Uh, sole head coach, he's recruited just so well. Uh, signed three five star recruits recently. Brought a great group uh, last year, including you know, Grace McCown from the Olympic team and Kara Aker and Olymp- an alter from the Olympic team. And the depth of talent they have now is right there. There were years, JT, where they would go to Nationals be ranked fifth or sixth, but you just felt like there was a gap between like, the top two or three teams and where Utah was. And, of course, you know, there's always a chance where you have everything time to get come together and have a great night that you could maybe win the whole thing. But it just feels like now that there's Oklahoma and Florida and Utah is kind of right there with yeah. them in that top three. And if you do that consistently – you go to nationals every year and you know talent wise you're right there with that top group eventually it's going to happen for you so that's what tom has done it just recruit consistently put together a solid roster build a program in a way that's going to be sustainable and they are certainly right there amongst the best the best of the best entering uh this 2023 season they really are and you mentioned too just it does feel like how you mentioned those programs that like year in and year out you know they're going to be towards the top i think for football we think of teams like alabama ohio state georgia that's what utah gymnastics is now they're up there with the oklahomas of the world and they're going to continue to be there and we're going to talk about oklahoma and preview that what should be a fantastic showdown this coming weekend but first you've had a couple opportunities to watch this team now what are some of your biggest takeaways from this red rocks team that even though they lost players like sydney Soloski, um cammy hall who's now on lsu unfortunately isn't able to compete with that injury, of course, a couple other key players from last year's teams off. It doesn't seem like they've missed a beat at all, and they're right there amongst those top programs, as you've talked about. Well, they did lose Sydney and lost Cammy, but they've got 21 and 24 routines from Nationals coming back this year. That's a lot. I mean, you talk about only three three routines over four events. Uh, they're not missing much, and their depth was already pretty good last year. Now you bring in another great recruiting class, so the talent and the depth is there. My impression has been, you know what, they've been very good the first two meets. They've scored well. We also feel like they haven't had their best meet, uh, which is a good thing because you score well, but you just feel like there's a lot more there across the board. It's not just one routine or two or even one event. It's really across the board where you're like, there's five 100s here, five 100s there, several routines where you're like, okay, you can see the potential for the big scores coming. And you don't want to be there in January. This sport, JT, is all about peaking and being healthy in April. So as we talked to Tom Farden before our meets, he goes, listen, we're going to have some different lives. We're going to bring some people out at different times and give us some depth and let them go and really stay healthy, pace it out. 
you know, we're not going to force the bet, the biggest scoring routines early, especially on vault where you've got 10 0 vaults and, you know, yes, in the end, you want to have a 10 0 possibility in the sticks and all that. They're not pushing for that stuff right now with their training and competition. So they're pacing it out. They've been very good, but certainly this is not a team that's even close to its peak in the month of January. You mentioned not close to their peak yet. We've seen them in two strong wins already, already beat LSU, won the best of Utah. That was more of something we expected to do as they're just clearly the best program in Utah at this moment. But what are some of the things you still want to see from this program and the things you think they still need to do to, so far to get to that point where they are in, they're going to, we expect them to be there at nationals at the end of the year, but where they're in a position, they'll have won nationals because they answered these questions that you still have. Yeah, it really comes down to just refining your competition form. So they've got uh, their 24 routines. 11 have new elements this year, which means there's a new pass on floor, a new bit dismount on beam, you know, things that are different from a year ago. And the reason why they did that is last year was good, but Tom's trying to think, how do we get those extra 500s here or there in this routine and that routine have a chance to win it? So they looked at things and said, you know what, here's how we're going to do it. It takes time. You can work on this stuff in the gym, but to do it under the lights with fans in the in the stands, it's different. And their first meet, they had 11 new elements. They had a fall on vault and another mishap on floor where Dana Rucker stepped out. But he's like, you know what? We were fine. We didn't have to count a fall uh, where someone steps out or, or doesn't uh, complete a routine cleanly. He was fine with that and you know didn't have any falls, anything like that on Saturday, the best of Utah meet, but still – you know, they didn't have their best people out there in every event either at this point. So really what we're seeing is just kind of this pacing of it. And I think uh, a couple of key people, Kara Aker for one, JT, uh, had an injury early last year, came yep. back, was very good on being late in the year. But we have we had a chance to watch her on floor and exhibition on Saturday. It looked pretty good. And a 10-0 arm beam. So she's someone who competed last year, but, you know, needed that kind of that full offseason to kind of just have everything come together. Uh, Grace McCown, the one is is the one who I'm most excited to see in April. And here's the deal, JT. She was on the Olympic team, and to get there is a process. You gotta go to Olympic trials. You gotta train. You made the Olympic team. You go to Japan. You come back. They did a tour with uh, the Olympic All Stars last fall. She was taking school online. Well, I got the campus in November. It's like okay, now I gotta do all my preseason, about two months worth of stuff in about a month. And had a very good year. Uh, had a couple of tens, I believe, on bars and some other high scores. But she had some falls as well. And it just seemed like she just wasn't quite settled. You know, Kendall Robarts Pond broadcast meets with me. And she said, you know, she just seemed rushed on bars. She seemed rushed here. Just wasn't quite settled. And you, you know how it is when you're busy, JT. You get through things. But you're yeah. like, you know what? I just wasn't relaxed. I didn't peak. I didn't do my best because of, I just had to kind of get through it. That's where Grace was last year. So this summer... She bought a mountain bike. She's been, you know, cruising around town, enjoying the outdoors. Had a chance to just kind of take a deep breath or two and relax. And she's in a different place now, just with her gymnastics mentally. Um, always a positive person, but just seems to be in a better spot to relax and let it happen this year. So for someone who was a former Olympian, I think people thought Washington would come in here and win a couple of national titles. It didn't happen last year because she wasn't ready to be that college gymnast who could do that yet. Um, I think this year, if she's not there now, she will get there. We're finally going to see everything she can be. And then you've got some people like Molly O'Keefe who are, you know, elite gymnasts coming out of, uh, you know, the, the club ranks. She was an elite gymnast, decided to step back, and, and instead of going after the Olympic dream, decided to go to college. But she's been one of the best level 10 gymnasts to come to the program. Uh, just so dedicated, so passionate. Um, a two-time national champion, but her best event has been balance beam. It just hasn't worked yeah. out in national. So I think she's got something to, to maybe achieve this year. She seems to be locked in and, and ready to go on every event I've seen her. So you talk about those three, and there's some others I can get into, but those three to me are kind of the key people. And I think, you know, with McCallum, she's already going all around, probably with most of the year. Milo Key doesn't go all around much till postseason, but when, she, when she's there, she's solid on all four events, you know, national champion caliber. Uh, and then, you know, Kara Aker just has enough, another level of refinement to her presentation on both beam. And I think now floor will come into that as well. You take those three, but here's another one for you. McKenna Smith, JT, a freshman who came in, highly recruited, five-star recruit, um, is ready on three events, competing three events pretty well, could go on a fourth. But to come in as a freshman and look as good as she's looked and just appears to be relaxed in her element, you kind of had at her as a fourth of those other three I mentioned with some other people who are very good as well. Abby Paulson uh, comes to mind. Jaden Rucker, former national champion in vault, you know, goes to events, is very top level on those. You know, I've mentioned about five or six people. Um, th there's just so much depth. There's a lot there to work with. And like I said, they're not trying to be at their best right now. It's very much pace it out. 
you want to be there in April, and, and the talent is certainly there to be right there in the conversation that final night this year. They definitely have the talent, and they've executed all through the past seasons. They're already off to a phenomenal start, and it's going to be fun to see what they can do. We're going to talk a couple more about those pieces on this team, the girls, and what they've been able to do on the season, and what we expect them to do going forward in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis all season long. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college basketball, NBA, NHL. They've got it all at Bet Online. You can also find sports podcasts there too. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Lags, talking about this Utah gymnastics team, I think one of the things that was a little bit of a surprise was Crystal Issa's return. I think a lot of people didn't expect her to come back. And you talked a couple of bit about the veterans on this team, Miley O'Keefe, who Miley blew up a little bit this week for some of her uh, fun dancing as well and uh, on the, <laughs> in the meet on Saturday. So got a little shine on her. Jaden Rucker, someone too, who returns to this program. And we mentioned people like Sydney not being there, but it feels like the leadership on this team is really strong. And you can tell the culture's in a really good place because you have girls like Issa who want to come back and be a part of for another season yeah i probably should have mentioned her earlier but she's been injured and had her uh, foot in the boot uh, an ankle injury a little behind but she'll be right there that top group with Jaden and all the other ones i mentioned as well but you know crystal um so we go into our first meet okay and sounds like yeah she's had this bum ankle she'll go on bars you'll see her on on beam at some point in january and he was right it was the first meet we didn't expect to see her that first night but she warmed up well and carly dockendorf just said you know what and she's the bean coach and assistant for tom she said you know She's a veteran. If she tells me she's ready, I'm going to trust that she's ready. And she went out there and had a great performance, had one as well on Saturday. So you know, she's someone on those two events that can be great, uh, but just the leadership, someone who has been around, has been about the team, just so positive, kind of has this little bounce to her a little bit. You think she's kind of goofing around, but yeah, she finds a way to be light, but, but be focused at the same time. And I think the team has sort of followed her lead with that where they are focused but they have fun. Uh, you look at that group, there's not a lot of tenseness, um, you know, a lot of uh, bickering, inner fighting amongst the team. And I think Chris has a lot to do with that. So, yeah, you talk about someone who could have left, but because of COVID 19, has got one more year. She, she's been a big part of what this team is going to do in terms of scoring, but just overall, in terms of their atmosphere and the crease in this, she's been a huge part of that for this group. She has really been a big part of this. And you mentioned this is a team that has the mix of veteran and youthful players too. Who are a couple of those players you think that for this team are already starting to do some nice things, but you think by the end of the season are not going to, going to be big contributors down the stretch or, but next year we're going to be very excited about. And I know we've talked about McKenna Smith and a couple of them so far, but are there any other names that stand out to you? You know, wanting to get to is Abby Brenner. She's a fifth year transfer from Michigan and, you know, really is, you know, Tom Farr has been very smart with recruiting and roster additions. He's looked at what he has and what he needs and addresses those. So Abby was at Michigan, won a national championship, but was outstanding on vault, which is an area where Utah was laying some points, slip aside uh, at nationals. Just needed to have more sticks, more consistency with those 10 old vaults and felt like Abby could help there. And she's been great on bars as well. So I think she's someone who's done pretty well, will come in the rest of the year and be great. You know, Tom likes Jillian Gilstrap. You know, Jillian Hoffman has a role. Um, Emily Morgan on bars has been great. Uh, Abby Paulson, you know, veteran who's, who's got a role with this team, but I, uh, Lucy Stanhope, I'm just going down the list. Sage Thompson yeah. has been fantastic on bars. Um, he's got just so much depth. And like I said, you don't have the need now for a bunch of all rounders. There's so many that can go really one, two, three events, but be so good on those three. You're like, they're a key part of it despite not going all around. But I think in terms of the future of the program, McKenna Smith is is really going to be a star for this program. And already we've seen it, um, you know, going three events right now, can go fourth, and she probably will at some point soon. But in terms of kind of that next wave, she's a leader. And then you look at the recruiting class for next year, they've got three five-star recruits coming in uh, who are all fantastic. So there really isn't a whole lot that you're going to lose in this group. And then the depth is there. Going to be even better heading into next year. But, you know, in terms of this team, we're seeing people kind of do what they're going to do. I think really right now, more than anything else, JT, it's really just refinement and and just kind of the small things and giving them some breaks where they're not going every night. That way they stay fresh. Their legs are still good come March and April. But um, this team just kind of, there's not like a lot. You say, well, you got to fix this or fix that. A lot of it's just good. It's just really kind of the small things intricate details is going to make the difference from where they are now to where they hopefully will be in April. One of the things this team did this past weekend was they competed at the best of Utah, where you have all these teams coming in and you don't have it at the university of Utah. You do have that 
at the Maverick Center. What are kind of the advantages of having kind of a neutral site meet, even though you're obviously sleeping in your own bed still, but at the Maverick Center and just the difference in the equipment it provides too, because I know it's very similar to what you get at Nationals at the end of the year too. That's a great question. and allows me to kind of get into this because um, you're like, listen, you draw 12,000 plus in Austin. Why in the world would you go across town to compete somewhere else? Well, at Nationals, the meet now stage on a platform, a uh, podium competition, where you, you have elevated equipment that are that's raised above the floor and it's a little bit more springy which is nice it, it kind of gives you a nice bounce and in terms of the presentation to be fans watching stuff above you or at eye level is nice and college arenas don't have this stuff generally so to have the chance to go do a podium meet across town is a huge advantage and also the pac-12 championships are at the maverick center so for the youth it's a chance to go out there to that venue where they want to win pac-12s in march get on the equipment they're also doing another podium meet in fort worth texas in a couple of weeks where george will be there so really the, the the thing is for college teams jt is they want to get on podium once or twice regular season if they can if they can do that they feel pretty good about getting the opportunity to be on the equipment get a feel for it and that's what Tom has done. The Maverick Center folks have been great. They bought the equipment to host Pac-12s. We'll be out there again in March. We're hoping to keep it here. But the stage is best of Utah meet to have another podium meet where BYU, Utah State, SU, they can get out there and this stuff as well. The, the, the best of Utah has been a great meet. Uh, Utah won for the fourth time on, on Friday. But also they've staged now the, the Wasatch Classic. So there was like eight other teams. In fact, there was eight other teams that came in. Yeah. On Saturday, I mean, Cal was here, UCLA, Oregon State, uh, some terrific, you know, non-Pac-12 teams. I think there was eight ranked teams in competition between Friday night and Saturday at the Maverick Center. And they all come because they want to be on equipment. You know, for those Pac-12 teams, it's an easy trip to come in. Again, Pac-12s will be there. So for UCLA and Cal and Oregon State to come in and be in that arena where the Pac-12s will be staged, that was huge for them. But to have arenas and people willing to invest in the equipment to stage these means to put them on, and one is great for the fans. Two is a great opportunity for the gymnasts. It's really fun to see how gymnastics has grown and and these regular season podium meets have been a big part of why the fans have, have been treated to some just great regular season gymnastics in recent years. There have been some great meets you mentioned for this Utah team. Some of the teams they've been able to welcome into those neutral sites too. And also some they've welcomed into the Hudson. I remember back to last year when Utah took on Oklahoma at home, they're going to be doing that this upcoming weekend. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I think one thing that I think some people are still confused by, I know I sure was last year, is kind of how the scoring in gymnastics works. Because you can have it where Utah will beat Oklahoma head to head, but yet Oklahoma will still say higher in the rankings. Talked about this, the fifth ranked Utah team. Oklahoma is currently one. You get Florida two, Michigan three, UCLA at four. I think, could you clear up some of the scoring things with gymnastics? Because I think for some people who come from more of the football, basketball backgrounds, me being from Texas, I was included in that. You come <laughs> in and you see a team went head to head and you're like, wait, why don't aren't they better? than that team then in the rankings it's uh it's a complicated formula i'll try to explain it the best i can so like say in football for instance where you've got the football playoff rankings well that's all done by a committee well gymnastics has a committee type thing by the coaches at the start of the year utah was ranked third oklahoma one florida two lsu six well what happened after week one is this, the rankings went to a scoring average well you have only one meet you've got one score so oklahoma scored higher Utah had a nice meet, but again, wasn't trying to be their best on night one, fell back to six. That doesn't mean there's a gap of one to six between Utah and Oklahoma. It just happens to be through the first couple of weeks. That's how it's worked out. Utah came up one spot to five this week after their score Friday. Um, but they, they do that scoring average to a certain point in the season. Then they say, okay, now it's about your national qualifying score, which is you got to have a road score in there. You throw out your high, but you throw out your low and take your other five to come up with your, your average amongst those five scores. And basically that allows you for a night that's not typically you to get thrown out. Your worst night gets thrown out. You have a road meet in there. So the format changes as you get to March. So in terms of rankings and you want to figure out where teams really are, to me, that's where you really see it. Um, once you get to that national qualifying score used for rankings, that's when you really see where teams are. But here's the other thing, JT. You know, Tom Farden, I asked him, listen, it's meet number one. Why have LSU coming here, the sixth ranked team? He said, you know what? There's no defense in gymnastics. This isn't about me coming up with a game plan to stop LSU. We just want to go out and score the highest score we can. So what you do is you want to get yourself in the arena with the best teams as many times as you can during the season. So your Pac-12 schedule is set. UCLA has been good. Oklahoma State has been good. Or I'm sorry, Oregon State has been good. Cal, uh, so on and so forth. Arizona State has been up and coming. But you go take on an Oklahoma Norman. You take on LSU. That gives you two more nights to be in the arena with the best teams with judges 
to really see where you are. And so he just said, you know what? We want to have the best schedule we can. Let's get after it and really see one where we are early on. You go to practice, you have an idea now. Okay, here's how we scored. Here's how we compare to them. But again, just have the judge look at your team and really give some feedback on how you're going to score as the course of the year moves on. So Tom is not backed away from competition. And uh, I think it's great for his team to see one, like I said, where they are. But for the fans to be able to come into the Huntsman and see them competing against LSU, they have the Pac-12 schedule for our fans to be able to watch me on ESPN on Sunday against Oklahoma. That's just great for the sport of gymnastics. 1,000%. I mean, it's one of the things that sometimes drives me nuts when it comes to football is you get Alabama playing the Citadel, Citadel in like week 10. It's like no one wants to watch that. We want to see the best go against each other. And it's a great point by Coach Fardum talking about the no defense like that because it does help you play the best. It's one of the things that makes it a lot of fun. And we're going to be breaking down that Oklahoma meet a little bit more in a second. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our friends at UCCU. Let UCCU make your family's dream of owning home come true by making it more affordable. Right now, UCCU is offering a low rate, 7 and 10 years ARMs with a rate in inflation projection and adjusted rate mortgage or arm for short comes with an initial low rate for seven to 10 years. After that, it adjusts to the rate that fluctuates based on the market. The big advantage of an arm is that it comes with an initial rate that's lower than a conventional mortgage. And with the lower rate, an arm gives you more purchase power than a traditional mortgage. In fact, you get up to 10% more house with an adjusted rate mortgage with the same payment as a conventional loan plus an adjust an adjustable rate mortgage can make qualifying for a mortgage loan easier for first-time home buyers. To learn more or get an arm, simply visit uccu.com and select an ARM that works best for you. Or stop by UCCU branch today. UCCU, love where you bank. All right, Mike, we've been talking about a lot. The success Utah's had already. Get a big, And we just got talk, done talking about playing the best. That's what Utah is literally doing as they're taking on the number one team in Oklahoma. Should be a great Good be a great match. What are some of the biggest things you're looking for in this one to see out of this Utah team? And how do they go about trying to get a win? Well, first of all, or first of all, um, KJ Kinner's done a great job at Oklahoma. She was at Iowa State, built the program there in gymnastics, then went to Oklahoma. It's interesting how her roster has been constructed. So Tom Farden, when he came into Utah, won as many elite gymnasts as he could get. Now, elite gymnasts is international competition. Those are the Olympic pool athletes. And there's level 10, which is right below that. And Tom told us this week, he said, you know, the leads have been great, but sometimes they are physically, you know, a little uh, beat up by the time you get to college and you can only have about so many roster spots. And he kind of said, you know, as I've evolved as a coach, I was some leads, but I've gone after more of these level 10 gymnasts and a Sage Thompson is a perfect example of that. She was a junior Olympic champion on bars. He's like, we needed, we had a need on bars. She flowed perfectly and has scored very well for her. So Tom's gone a little more diversified in terms of his roster makeup as of late. Oklahoma's done that a lot. They've got a lot of level 10 gymnasts on their roster who weren't the biggest names, but were highly accomplished at level 10 who have gone to college. They've scored very well. It, it was your score routines in college and elite level JT. Elite level requires skills that college just does not. So we've had gymnasts like Grace McCallum, um, Michaela Skinner, who've been able to do things that college does not require them. Now they'll do it for fun, but what Oklahoma's done more of is like, okay, here's what you need for college. They've got athletes who do those and do it very well consistently. They score well. That's how they've won the national championship. So a little bit of a different roster construction for KJ Kinder than what Tom's had, but Tom's kind of evolved a little bit more towards that. So for them, for Oklahoma, it really is about the team. I mean, there are former Olympians out there that have been at UCLA, you know, Auburn, uh, some other programs had them. Maybe not the biggest names for Oklahoma in terms of pre-college careers, but they are an incredibly sound a technically sound, efficient team that just doesn't make a lot of mistakes. And so for Utah, you go in there knowing that, listen, they're not probably going to beat themselves. That just isn't who they are. They came to the Huntsman Center last year, had some COVID issues. They weren't their best, uh, weren't physically ready to go. Utah won that meet, but we saw Oklahoma later in the year. Nationals obviously did a lot better. I think we'll see a pretty good Oklahoma team. They've scored well to start the year. Um, so that would be a challenge. But really for Utah, as I said, uh, JT is, is Tom Farm once against his team and they ran with the best teams as many times as you can. Here's your first chance, other than LSU, to do that, uh, you know, before you go to Pat 12 competition. And also now you do it on the road. So to be against uh, the number one team on the road, your first true road meet, you want to see how your team responds to that environment, especially if things don't go well. And so I think a lot to gain from this meet for Utah. It's on national television. 
to, to be featured on the you know the mothership on a Sunday afternoon. That's prime time gymnastics. A lot of things to gain from that meet. You could go in there as Utah J T and lose that meet, but if you're competitive, uh, learn some things about your team, show well. There's really nothing to lose from that experience on Sunday. So I'm excited to see how this team handles that environment and performs in the, that arena on Sunday afternoon. It's going to be a great opportunity. It doesn't get much easier after that. You get UCLA coming up after you get Washington. This is It's going to be an interesting to see how this team navigates those stretches. And But as you mentioned, the most important thing is just to continue to shore up those little things, right? You just want to be playing your best by the time March rolls around late for this Utah gymnastics team. Well, you go to nationals and even regionals, JT, is yeah. tough. It used to be a one night competition, regionals with six teams, and you know, it was a one and done deal. Two went through. Now, regionals is a, a possibly a three night event. They've got kind of the eight nine playing, if you will, on a Wednesday. Thursday, you've got two sessions of four teams, the top two from each go to Saturday. And you've got a four team meet our Saturday with two teams advancing. That's a grind now to get the nationals. Then you go to nationals, it's eight teams, but they're all like really, really high level teams. There's not like kind of that nine, 10, 11, 12 anymore. So you've got to be at your best. So really your, your coaching philosophy is we got to be ready and to be our best come April. Well, a way to test your team is to have meets like at Oklahoma, LSU come to your building where you really test your team early and see how they respond. And that way when nationals roll around and you're in the arena with Oklahoma and LSU and, you know, UCLA, those type of programs at Nationals of Fort Worth, you're not freaked out about who, you, who you're competing against. And when they go out there and throw up these big scores and the crowd roars, it's just another night. You know, yeah. you're not going to be freaked out by the fact, that, oh, look what Oklahoma's doing or look what Florida's doing. You've seen them already. You know who they are. You know their personnel. And really, it's that mental preparation for the last two nights is why you do me like you do, like you're going to have coming up on, on Sunday. It's going to be a great opportunity for the youth, and it'll be a lot of fun to see how it plays out. Mike, I know we've talked a lot about all your work you do, calling the Utah Gymnastics meets, calling some basketball games as well, too. But I know you're also very involved with the Clemson – excuse me, wow, excuse me <laughs> – with the Crimson Club. Tell us more about what your work you do with that and how people can get involved. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I've been with the department now going on 28 years. I worked in meet relations, done some broadcast work, as you mentioned, for you know, a lot of our sports, from women's basketball and up to football, and a lot of baseball and volleyball as of late, done gymnastics. And, you know, we just had a knee in the Crimson Club a couple months ago to grow our staff after some people moved on. And we're trying to do some things differently. And they just said, you know what, you've been around the department. You know a lot of our donors. You know a lot of our former athletes. You know our history. To talk about why it's important to give to support scholarships and the fund our programs, you know as well as anyone why that's important because you've, you've seen it grow from where it was in the WAC to where it is now in the Pac-12. And you have a sense of what we need to do to keep you know, growing and advancing. And it's really just, you know, it's support financially from our donors to to keep this thing rolling and to support scholarships. So it was an easy sell for me to say, you know what, I can talk about this because I, the stuff, because I really honestly truly believe it, understand why it's important, love our people, love our history, love our former athletes and our current athletes. I know them. So it was an easy role for me to get into. And I'm just excited what we're doing. We hired, um, Rob Clark from San Jose State, who was a lead external guy. He's been uh, around the West. He worked in New Mexico, worked at Texas A&M. He's a Utah native. In fact, he grew up down the street from the campus. He's come in and really has some great ideas with how we grow the Crimson Club. We kind of call it Crimson Club 2.0 with how do we offer more to our donors you know, to really get them you feel like, you know what, it's worth my affiliation, my investment with the program beyond tickets and parking. So we're coming up with some ideas for some things to do uh, for all levels. And uh, a lot of it's in the preliminary stages. We're going to be sending out some questionnaires to our members the next week, in fact, about what they like about our current benefits, what some ideas we've got that they might like to see what their feedback is. And really the next three to four months, look to make some decisions on how do we change it, how do we grow it, and, and make it more of a user-friendly crypto club moving forward. And I just can't talk enough about how much I appreciate our people. I mean, JT, for us to take 30,000 fans just from Utah ticket sales to the Rose Bowl back-to-back -back years, and there was more there than that. There was probably you know, 50, 60 uh, when you went there on game day. To do that back-to-back -back years, that shows you where this fan base is. We've been sold out for every home football game since 2010. So the support's there. The passion's there. Um, they turn up for gymnastics like crazy. Men's basketball is growing. Women's basketball went to their game yesterday. They beat Arizona. The crowds are coming up for them. You know, volleyball is drawn well. Soccer's drawn well. The rest are coming up. The fan base is just has been with us, and we're trying to figure out now how do we get more people in with us? How do we take care of people who can't get football tickets? I mean, there's like 8,000 Muslims out there who can't get football tickets because there's none to be had or they live out of town. 
how do we get them tied with us? So we're going to do a lot of things where it's, it's more um, beyond tickets and parking and some of the normal things we've been done. It's how do we get people really feel like they're close to us and, and let them know us more, let them know our people more. And that's going to be our, our, our approach as we look to grow this in the next five, six months. Make sure you guys head over to utahathletics.com and select Clint. Crimson Club to get more involved with the Crimson Club. Lags, always appreciate you coming on. Make sure you guys tune in to ESPN 700. Do catch the radio broadcast for all the home meets. And I know later on in the season, you guys will be traveling with the team too. Always fun to check that out. Also, make sure you guys follow Lags at Utah Lags. And Mike, always great having you on. Appreciate you joining us. Hey, uh, great to be with you, JT. I can tell people I knew you when, uh, when you just got started. And uh, I knew you'd make it. You had the drive and uh, your passion's there. And it's been fun being on with you. So uh, let's do it again, huh? We definitely will. Thank you again for joining us, Lags. Also want to thank you guys for making us your first listen every single day. But in your, if you're in the market for a second listen every day, make sure you guys check out Locked On College Basketball. They have the biggest games covered, the biggest stories in college basketball. They'll have big interviews with experts, insiders, coaches, and players, all available on Locked On College Basketball, available wherever you get our own podcast, Locked On Utes. And that's going to do it for today's episode, but we'll see you tomorrow.